this underway with this question about what's unique about human experience, um, I will kind of run across the panel. I'll ask each of the panelists just to say a word or two about themselves. So for those who weren't here during the day, yet uh, uh, you can position yourselves in the conversation. Um, and then just give us a first three minutes on how you're seeing that question as what's unique uh, about human experience and intelligence uh, uh, today. We'll start down on Scott Anthony. Uh, through the short or long straw, depending on how you look at it. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Scott Anthony. I'm the managing partner of an organization called Innocite. I am, as you can tell from the accent, American. I am based in Singapore and have been based there since 2010. Tanya would like me to stand up, and I listen to everything that Tanya says, so I'm going to stand up for these brief remarks. The people on the panel are much smarter than I am. So I thought I would do something a little bit different, which is ask my kids how they would answer this question. Let's see how this works. Can we roll the video that I submitted? Cross your fingers, everybody. This is technology that has not been tested. the third that was added right now. My first reflection is my Holly, who's nine years old. She's got five years to catch up to the Holly we just saw on stage. But I think we ought to give another round of applause for that. Is <laughs> the second reflection is this is just one of many really deep questions that we will all have to wrestle with. And you can see kids struggle to answer it as well. What will be unique about the human experience? This is going to change. We're not that different than machines. We're powered by electricity. Our batteries need to be recharged. Our parts get replaced. We even have an external brain that gives us answers to just about anything when we need it. This question of what distinguishes a human will be really hard to answer. My third reflection is I think kids are awesome. You saw three of my four. My fourth is 14 months old. He's not quite ready to comment on these things. But what do children have? Children have curiosity, they've got creativity, they've got passion, they're willing to try and do things like this. This is what the world needs, this is what makes us human. The challenge that we all face is our institutions constrain those basic factors, they take them away from us. We as parents must make sure that children never lose that love of learning. We as adults who work with other adults need to bring it back in all of our colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'm actually going to skip you on, Patricia, and ask uh, Raymond to kind of uh, go next. You've got to stay in execution. <laughs> so, I tend to come down very firmly on both sides of this issue. And then I kind of look at what do I really believe about. So in the, in the short term, while well, I'm really impressed with all the things that technologists have done, with everything going on. And I should say that I myself am a technologist. So I'm Raymond McCauley. I'm uh, the, the chair of digital biology at Singularity University. So I'm less in the machine world and more in the, the blood and tissue world. So there's a lot going on right now with AI. And it's really impressive. But it's also in fairly narrow areas. So I, I like to think about all of these things where we have Deep learning, which is a fancy name for what we used to just call really great neural networks. It's good at doing things if those things look like pictures of cats. Basically, if you go ahead and say, is this a cat picture, is this not a cat picture? If you look at any of these domains of knowledge, it's about, does it look like cat pictures or not? And, and I don't just mean it only works on cats, but it's that sort of sorting, that sort of classification. There are still things that we're having trouble with, natural language understanding, 
the long-term planning, some of these pieces. Whenever I look at it, though, in the long run, I think that there's no reason that machines can't gain and keep gaining and digitally copy and improve on all these things that we think make us uniquely human. The history of technology has been about things where we said, oh, we're human and machines or animals can't do X. A machine can't play chess, a machine can't write poetry, a machine can't infer something from two other things. And we just keep being proven wrong on this over and over again. So I think there is a time coming when more and more things get taken away from that unique human experience. Whenever I, I talk to my friends who work in automation, I say, what are those pieces that are left? They kind of give me a high and a low. And they say, well, machines are still not good at complex problem solving that lacks rules. And then they try to give me some examples like diagnosing disease. And then somebody else says, oh, no, no, I know a good machine to do that. And so even that's a little unsteady. They say, well, machines are really not good at being, you know, robots doing manual labor that's unstructured, like a robot can pick and place and do some things and work really quickly and accurately, but it can't fold clothes or put up dishes. And I'm like, well, that's the first thing I want them to do. So, <laughs> But at the very end of the day, I kind of come down to how do I look at this with my children and what do I try to instill in them? And let me ask you, how many of you have children? How many of you have Alexa or something like that in your home? How many of you who are doing that are making your children say thank you and please whenever they talk to the nice little robot that lives in your home? <laughs> so we've started doing that, and part of that's for civility, you know, because I don't like them saying, go do this. It's like, no, don't talk to anybody that way. But part of it is we say, listen, that AI is going to have a really long memory. And I didn't know <laughs> if that was going to be a thing or not. And then one of my kids said to me, they said, Daddy, you don't call it an AI. It's a machine intelligence. You sound prejudiced. So I think maybe that's where we're going. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Patricia, can I invite you to kind of reflect on where you think this line might lie? Sure. Um, so my name is Patricia. I uh, spent many years studying the logic of the human soul, which is psychology. And so my answer is pretty obvious. Um, yes, we're very, very unique. Um, and I think there are many, many pieces. I try to twiggle it into three, three, three major themes. The first one is inspiration. We got inspired. Um, people inspired me today on the stage. I, I must say I, uh, I came, um, you know, there's a lot of troubling things happening in the world. And, and I came in kind of groomy mood. And, and, and I picked fights with people during dinner um, <laughs> just, just to kind of get my aggression out. And I was sitting here at the <laughs> opening session. And I said, this is inspiring. What those people are doing is very inspiring. And, and I think we have that ability to get inspired by others, by nature, by you know, sci-fi, right? The things that can be, and that's, that leads me to innovation. We have ability to detect patterns. That, and yes, computers can, machines can detect patterns, but we can detect patterns in different ways. We can take something from the nature world and build Sagrada Familia, right? We can take something from the kinesthetic thing and we can put it in our head and be like, I'm gonna sense food now, I'm gonna hear food. Um, so that's innovation. I think we can do innovation better than anybody else and for a long time. The second one is imagination. Um, you know, I think it was Mahatma Gandhi who said, you can torture this body, you can imprison this body, you can cut it off, you can cut it into pieces, yeah. but you can chain and you can put my imagination into a box. And that's exactly right. The places where human imagination can go, the futures we can imagine, and the theme here today is campfire. I mean, imagination, the campfire, and stories told over a campfire has happened for generations. It would be the elders telling the stories and then the books spreading, right? Telling stories, and some of the greatest leaders say, I have a dream, and it's not, they don't say, you know, I calculate on spreadsheets that, you know, one day revolution will happen. No, they say, let's throw it out there and let's have a dream where kids can play together and completely equal, right? Um, and that leads me, so that's, that's the second point, is the imagination, which I think is so unbounded. And, um, Maybe we'll talk about that, maybe not. There's a book called Homo Deus, which asks a question of what will happen when we will merge with machines, we will be humans. Um, one thing that, this, that he says is actually one thing that, again, is unchained, which actually 
troubles a lot of governments and a lot of companies is our imagination, right? That's the last thing that can be controlled, that can be measured, that can be targeted, that can be harvested, that can be sold too. Um, because in some way we own our imagination. And then finally, the final piece is introspection. Um, not inception, that's two. Introspection, the ability to look in. And um, as a psychologist, I'm fascinated by, not by you know, smooth surfaces that we touch every day. We touch our phones on average two and a half thousand times a day. But the rough surfaces of that are organic. So, you know, the life is not smooth. Life is bumpy. Touch any organic surface and it's, it's raw um, and it's messy and life is non linear. And, and introception is the ability to be with that and to the full depth and width of the human experience. And I don't think machines have that. Thank you. Alessandra, can I turn to you now? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm Aleksandra Przegalinska, uh, originally Polish, uh, but I now work and live uh, in Boston. I, I work at MIT, and I uh, work with artificial intelligence uh, and data science, wearable technologies, bots, Alexas, humanoid robots, and all that stuff. But apart from that, I'm also a philosopher. I was trained as a philosopher, and I think I'm going to put the philosopher head on today. So there are two answers that I could give probably here to this question. First one is obviously consciousness. Consciousness is the hard problem of science and neuroscience in particular. Consciousness is something that is hard to recreate, right? This is something absolutely exceptional. This is ours, right? Our subjectivity, our feeling of individuality, our identity. These are issues that definitely robots do not have and uh, well it's very hard to actually imagine a future for us scientists where we could actually do it at all so uh consciousness but then again um you know uh this question made me question the question uh really because uh why do we want to be so exceptional uh is my question why do we even ask the question about our exceptionality in this world why do we want to be so special so particular and so different from all the other species, you know. And obviously, you know, when I interact with various robots and we do experiments um, where we are trying to see how uh, human-machine interaction kind of flows. And obviously, when you put a humanoid robot like Sophia in front of a person, the difference is clear, you know. I mean, Sophia is nowhere near a human being, right? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, when we were doing experiments with bots, such as Alexa, we have noticed that actually people run on scripts, you know, they do. They use particular phrases, they behave in conversations in particular ways that can be foreseen. And we were, well, when we saw it, we, we thought we are a bit like bots too. It was our observation during the experiment. We were those bots in a way, you know, we behave in a certain way, we run on scripts. And, uh, you know, that made me think, you know, maybe that's not so bad at all. And also maybe this computational metaphor of the brain and the mind also isn't that bad. It's not offensive and it's not an offense to be compared with a machine. So I would say like in the future, maybe let's look for similarities. And what I would want to do, you know, being really uh, in love with my field because I, I really like what I do. And I, I think artificial intelligence is really fascinating. I would like to instill values and human principles in artificial intelligence, right? We can also do that. We don't have to think about artificial intelligence as something separate from us, something that is different, and then put ourselves in a situation where we are the slow and dumb ones, right? And it's fast and, and it's m way more rational and so on. Let's not compare ourselves. Let's try to create technologies that are more like us in order to feel the similarity rather than, you know, compare ourselves with machines where I don't think this comparison really ever helps. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Neil, can I invite you to yeah, I actually open completely some agree with what was just said. I think machines might actually get we will be, it will, they will be considered as a species as well, and we shouldn't be afraid of them being, uh, having more uh, abilities or less, in the same way that we shouldn't be feeling superior to species that maybe have less senses than us. We should all be respected, regardless of the amount of senses or knowledge or abilities we have. If we compare ourselves with other species that exist now, we should not feel superior, and we shouldn't feel inferior to species that will exist in the future. So I think maybe the difference between machines and 
us is that we will have the chance of telling machines where they come from, whereas we w might never know where we really come from as a species. I didn't introduce myself. I'm an artist, cyborg artist. I've decided to merge with technology in order to extend my perception of reality. So if I feel that I am technology. And I, I think in the future, there'll also be people deciding to merge with technology. And this will allow us to decide also what senses and organs we want to have as, as a species. That's it. I think Thank, it's, you. Thank you. <laughs> and Tina, to conclude our kind of opening observations. Hello, everyone. I'm Xenia Tata, and I'm with XPRIZE. We're a foundation. We're a futurist group. And uh, we look out into the future across different uh, sectors and domains, and we look at breakthroughs that we feel are going to happen maybe 10, 20, 50 years from now. And we say, what the hell? Why, why do we have to wait for that future to occur? Let's reach out grab that future and make that happen now. We're techno-optimists. We uh, feel that technology is a great enabler to solve some of the world's grandest challenges. And so we embed <coughs> that technology or blend that technology into, uh, into our solutions. And we do that by putting out these big incentive prizes to incentivize new innovators and innovators to come out from everywhere to solve some of humanity's big challenges. So that's, that's the quick background. Um, man and machine, um, great conversations. I mean, at, at XPRIZE, we kind of have these water cooler chats pretty much every day, and uh, we're all uh, violently divided <laughs> about what, what the future holds. And I agree with uh, some of my colleagues here, and, and again, as a futurist organization, thinking and talking about the future, the only way that we humans know how to grapple with the future is to tell stories about it. We relate, in the end, people relate to people, and people relate to stories about people or machines. It doesn't matter. I also believe that there's going to be that blended reality where technology kind of just sort of operates in the background to, to enhance our human experience. But we will always have that uniqueness, that ability to tell those stories, to inspire each other. And what really will separate us in some ways is drive. And maybe my more technical colleagues will disagree with that, that you can build that into a machine. But the truth is, as human beings, we're motivated by very different things. We're motivated by something much bigger than us. We're Call it a higher power, call it others. It could be all kinds of different things. And that motivation is what will always separate us from, uh, from a lot of other species, too. So, thank you. Great. We could risk converging here. So I'm going to try and push uh, for a little divergence. And what I've seen so far is the defense of the human has not been mounted around intelligence. We've kind of conceded that ground. Nobody who was defending the uniqueness of the human wanted to say there was some calculative or other capacities that would set us, set us apart. The defense of the kind of the uniqueness of the human, it was mounted really around a notion of imagination, of humans as, story, as storytellers, as inspirers, as having, uh, as having uh, drive. And I'm just going to leave the consciousness thing to one side for the moment. I appreciate it. And that's a, a next step defense. But right now, we've got the kind of line drawn, the defensive barrier drawn around these qualities. So I, I'm going to get those who kind of play in the AI world to say, can that be sustained? So can we really say that uh, you know, the algorithms of the future, or even the ones we've got now, aren't going to be storytellers or can't make the kind of leaps from nature to the Sagrada Familia, um, as Patrizia said, or can't do the kind of uh, say or be motivated in ways we might recognize as inspiring? Is there any kind of logical reason to think that that isn't going to be possible or isn't possible now? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna start, with you, uh, start with you, Raymond. I have to go ahead and concede that high ground immediately to the machines. I, I think, you know, whenever we define ourselves just by that, 
these machines that we're creating, in a sense, are our children. And we're doing that to some degree in our image, the image of our minds and our bodies. And I think like good parents, we want our children to do better than us. And then we also get a little bit afraid when they do. <laughs> so I, I really do think in the, the long run that... And why do you think that is? What, what, is the, what are the kind of evolutions of technology, of the way we're thinking about writing algorithms that give you the confidence that, it will be a, that we will achieve those things as well, which have been where the defense is? I'm not sure that we actually get there by writing algorithms and understanding it, and, but I think, you know, if for no other reason I, I can put forth a thought experiment where the black box of the human mind, if you will concede that that is congruent with the human brain, then, yeah, I can recreate a neuron and put it in a computer now. Uh, I just can't do a trillion of them. And so we were looking today earlier at a digital organism. We had scanned in basically all the connections in a worm and recreated it in a computer. And the difference between that worm with its 300 some odd neurons and our brains with a trillion is scale, but there's not really any qualitative difference. Okay. Alessandro, do you play a lot in this space? Where, where, where do you uh, line up with Raymond on this? Well, um, I would say that I do see that artificial intelligence uh, is now, on one hand, a thriving field, but the more thriving it is, the more we see how, 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 how many kind of different features that we do possess it lacks. Um, and so, for instance, I work in a field of um, affective computing, which is essentially um, um, an attempt to uh, collect various kinds of body signals and mental signals and then feed the machine with those signals so that it becomes a bit more responsive to your mood, to how you feel, uh, you know, to your emotions on a very basic level. And this is a very early stage. You know, we are very humble because we feel that, uh, as you said, black box is a very good notion here. You know, we have this fantastic organ here. It's functionally perfectly okay, we all think, here in this room. Do we know how we think? Not so much. Now we're creating uh, a different field of deep learning where we already at this stage, and that happened with AlphaGo, this recent very fantastic, I would say, program that was winning in the uh, traditional game of Go. It uh, kind of, uh, it processes the information in a way that is inaccessible to humans. So it's also a little black box now, right? And um, the more complexity we see in this whole field of artificial intelligence, also the, the more we see how, how difficult it is to recreate more and more complex processes. Emotions are very, very complex. And here we are very, very early. And frankly speaking, when I, I think about this question, you know, whether uh, technology will be able to reach a stage of human level emotional intelligence or social intelligence, intelligence, I, I, I really don't know if it's going to happen anytime soon. I know that there are various, you know, uh, uh, futurists who are super optimistic about singularity and it being near and so on, but um, I think it might be an evolutionary process, uh, really, to create emotions. And uh, I also think that probably silicone is not the most uh, I would say the best possible material to create artificial general intelligence and because well we have wetware right we are we consist of a different kind of matter and here it works we have a body that is a very important transmitter of our intelligence if artificial intelligence doesn't have a body I don't think it'll ever reach a stage of emotions and these kinds of perceptual experiences that we have so I would say it's, it's really very, very early in, in this field, and, um, well, the, the, progress will be, the progress will be very hard if we want to go that way. But do you think we can get there? Because uh, huh. Raymond is making the argument that conceptually we've crossed the bridge. We can model what neural structures look like, and it's just mm. a question of, of scale. You've introduced the notion that perhaps, you know, unless we've got wetware, I like mm. the idea that I have wetware, mm. um, uh, that we need to be going beyond just doing that to get to the state of, that we would need. Can we get there? Well, uh, there was this guy today, um, I think he, he's kind of famous, but I forgot his name. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but he's a scientist, not a celebrity. And he just 
said that singularity won't happen, and he calculated that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, you hear these voices, you get to hear these voices. People say, okay, it's logically possible, but then, but then it's implausible. It's not going to happen anyway, even if we see the pathways to it. Uh, for instance, the obstacle can lie elsewhere. If we don't uh, align artificial intelligence with the programs in neuroscience, for instance, and if we don't understand the human brain, perhaps this artificial brain will not move right from where it is right now. It will not be able to progress because we will not, won't know how to solve it, uh, unless, obviously, it progresses without our intervention. But it, we are not at this stage now. So, you know, the, the sincere answer is I, I, I really consider it highly possible, but I don't know. Okay. So we've got from the kind of the logically possible to the highly possible. Scott, you want to come in and put a challenge here? Yeah, well, so I, I, I mentioned before these people are much smarter than me. I have an MBA, which means I know nothing about everything, but I'm happy to opine on anything. So <laughs> I, I, and I spend a lot of time on airplanes, so I watch a, a lot of movies. So I, I've been <laughs> listening to this conversation and thinking about a couple movies from the 1990s. The first one I was thinking of was Jurassic Park. And in that movie, Jeff Goldblum said, life finds a way and technology finds a way. I find it impossible to believe that these problems won't ultimately be served, whether uh, solved, whether that's in 20 years or 200 years, who knows, but these issues will all be addressed. They will be. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And I say, thank goodness, because the other movie I was thinking about, I got a quote here, Rufus. This is from the movie, The Matrix. Human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. You are a plague and we are the cure, so says as Agent Smith. And I think the world could very well be a much better place when we get to the next stage of evolution and we've got artificial intelligence running things. I think the only thing we got to hope for is we put just enough humanity in it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so we've got, we've really got kind of three who see this as logically possible. Neil, you're, you're on the journey. Um, so I'm wondering where you see this conversation about where we ultimately get to and how you, how you feel about that. Is. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps, uh, to, to the new guests, I mean. To explain what I, this yes, is. Yes, because some people um, don't know what that is. Yeah, so I created this antenna which is implanted in my head that allows me to extend my perception of color beyond the visual spectrum. So it allows me to feel from infrareds to ultraviolet so vibrations in my head. So it's a new organ that allows me to extend my perception of reality. And I identify myself as a cyborg, which is the union between cybernetics and organism. So I, I'm not, I don't feel I'm using or wearing technology. I feel that I'm, I am technology. And I identify with the word cyborg because it's the union between cybernetics and organism. So I guess I think in the future there will be more people, I think, uh, biologically merging with technology. Uh, and this will allow us to decide who we want to be as a species, we'll be able to decide what senses and organs we want to have as a species. Um, there'll be also people who won't be doing it, and then there'll also be machines that will have their own intelligence and their own lives and their own uh, feelings. So I guess there'll be like three different branches uh, in the future, and we will all hopefully respect each other uh, in the same way that, mm -hmm. well, we, I think we should also respect other species. We shouldn't eat them, and we shouldn't, uh, like, I think we should respect all species, including the ones that will come in the future. Um, I don't know. So we've got a, a, a now quite a strong majority on the panel believing that, making a strong argument that we will, this, uh, this uniqueness ultimately is dissolvable. It's a question of time frame. It's a question of the kind of mechanics of the how. Um, but that looks uh, a, a, a seriously possible destiny. So, Patricia, I'm going to come to you and say, and, and, and Zina, I'll be with you on this in a moment as well. Should we allow that future? We saw the audience doubt that. 50% weren't so sure that was a future that we should be allowing, that we want to be uh, holding back from ever getting there. What do you think? Well, first of all, I, I'm still perplexed. Um, you know, why are we asking this question um, during the dinner? I, so, the, so I wonder, are we afraid of, of, of that happening? Are we excited about it? Do we think that the machines are gonna gain consciousness? And, and yes, we are a plague in some way, right? Uh, and because of that consciousness, we're gonna get destroyed. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit unclear, um, a little bit why. Well, I guess this is putting us in a position of choice. 
if we know, if we have enough people saying this is a possible future, mm -hmm. then one of the great things about kind of thinking about where technology is taking us is we can make some human choices about whether we want that future or not. The great danger is when we don't put ourselves in a position of choice and think about whether that's what we want. And tonight here we've got a question of is that yeah. the future we want? And that's yeah, what I'm no, asking no, you. No, that's uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I think there's technology we can control. Um, there are technologies we can control, and the technology we definitely can control is our own technology. Um, what Alexandra mentioned, wetware. Um, I think it's a fantastic technology that we work with. We have control over. Um, yes, the brain is fantastic, but the brain has an owner. Um, there's something that emerges out of those 100 billion cells and 100, 100 trillion synaptic connections, which is you know, consciousness, a call in mind. Mind expands beyond the brain, we know that. Potentially expands into the body, and potentially, you know, there's strong evidence for that, extends beyond our body and exists in between people. And we talk about neural coupling when the brain wave starts syncing up, and we literally feel another human being. And that happens during the storytelling. Um, I think that's what we can control. Now, can we control the machines? I think that's a question for those guys, really. But do you want to? Do I want to? Do you want to? Do you want that future where we're no longer unique? Well, you know, in psychology we have a saying, um, primus inter pares, which means um, superior among equal ones. And so we all feel, we all want to belong and we all want to feel yet a little bit better than everybody else. And, and I think that's very unique to us, right? So yes, we all kind of hear, but I'm a little bit better than you guys because you know, I'm Polish or whatever. Um, and everybody at the table also has that, right? Um, so I, I, I think I agree with, with Alexandra. I think the question is not posed the right way. I don't think we, yes, we are unique, but we're not at the same time. And that is our human nature's, it's the nature of the life. It's, it's the opposites, right? And um, I think Fitzgerald said that, you know, it's, it's the, the rate of higher intelligence is the ability to hold the two opposites at the same time and still function. And I think we, we as a hum, human life, we always have those two opposites, right? Yes, we're special and yes, we're not. Yes, there's good and there's evil. Yes, we are the scum of the earth and yet we are, you know, the ones that make it so wonderful. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. Seen it. I agree. We are complex. Uh, uh, a species that, that love to live in this dichotomy. And, uh, um, you know, I, I think some of this stuff is just uh, just eventual. It will happen when it will happen. Uh, some AI specialists are saying that the first step is to just even recreate the intelligence of a rodent. We're not even there yet. And, mm -hmm. and you know, in terms of uh, a singularity, I'm talking about something sentient, you know, that, that, that we're so, we're 100, 150 years away from that. And then others like Ray and others will say that, that you know, it's, it's here in the next uh, 30 years or 40 years or... Uh, even that number keeps kind of moving around. What interests me about what, what everyone's been talking about is this kind of notion, uh, Neil, that you were saying, that there are going to be these different groupings. You know, there's going to be machines and there's going to be humans that have, uh, uh, that have different kinds of abilities and augmentations and uh, that, that are merged with machines, so, so cyborgs. But then there's also going to be uh, other humans that are genetically m uh, manipulated to, to be and do different things, and, uh, but whenever we talk about this, and Alexandra, I was inspired by what, what you said in your earlier comment, whenever we talk about it, we, talk, we have this vision in our mind, you know, of a humanoid robot. And why is that? Because the truth is, uh, if, if life was to evolve, uh, and I mean, people have done these studies, you know, uh, thousands of years from now, what would an ideal species look like? And it's more like a, ce a cephalopod, right? Mm. With, with, with multiple limbs and tentacles, and, and they could be arboreal and live in trees, and they could be you know, living underwater, and they could be living, you know, in different ways. And so why? Why do we have this image in our mind all the time that, that again, it has to be kind of this humanoid form? And I love the idea of this, this expansive and inclusive mindset that says that we're going to be many different things and there are going to be many different mergers. I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm going to use a very silly 
banal example of even 100 years ago, an interracial couple would be looked at in an odd way, you know? Forget people with other, other sexuality, you know? So in the same way in the future, uh, we, we probably will not have such strong lines be uh, between um, with acceptance, and, and we will have different categories of what it really means to be human and to be kind of, sort of human, you know? Mm -hmm. So do we worry that if we create that kind of uh, world, that there are categories of people who get left behind, who don't have all of these capacities that we're now highly valuing? We seem to leave an awful lot of people behind right now. What about the kind of world where now this uh, great capacity is available effectively for sale, that you can buy it? Um, so you all see this world coming about. I'm wondering how you're feeling um, about who's actually in this world and whether it leads us to uh, have people without those capacities being as equally, equally valued. And I might give uh, that question to Scott, and then we're going to go to some questions from the floor. All right, so I, I think it's a great question, Rufus. And my own perspective on that is it is a massive issue. And I think you've got two potential issues there. One is the haves versus the have-nots being really exacerbated. When you have some who have the ability to advance genetic engineering and merge with machines in ways that make them much superior in many areas, and many who do not, you have what is already a global issue, essentially on steroids. So that's a huge issue. The second issue is there are going to be big transformations and big changes in many of the things we've talked about in this conference, the nature of work, the nature of employment, and so on, as all these things happen. And we as a society are not only not prepared for it, we are not having adequate levels of discussion about this. It's one of the things that I really have come to appreciate living in Singapore. Like every political system, Singapore has its flaws, but you can call the question, what do we think our economy will look like in 2035? What do we want it to look like? And what do we do as a nation to get there? And that involves changing the way that we do primary education. It involves investing in a program called Skills Future, where everybody can upskill themselves. It's not perfect, but at least the question is being asked and it's being discussed. So I, I think it's a massive issue. I think it'll perturbate through every organization and every institution. And we need to start talking about this 15 years ago. We're way behind in talking about this and even further behind in doing anything about it. Terrific. Well, we might take a pause there for any questions that we've got uh, in the audience or an observation if you want to defend your humanity in some uh, <laughs> untold way that we haven't heard tonight. There's somebody defending. Hands up. Yeah. yeah. There's no ethicists on stage. There's no, there's everybody talking about what we may or what we could or what we should move towards, but there's nobody there to guide the conversation about what is good and how do we have this conversation. In Australia, we've recently had the same-sex marriage survey and yet we've seen the controversy that that has elicited. How do we have this conversation about where we should go when we don't have a moral conversation or a platform mm. for a moral conversation. Does anyone want to take... Uh, I, I, I could just re respond very briefly uh, uh, that I uh, very much agree with this comment, but the, the good news is that, uh, uh, well, in our field in AI, we haven't really felt the need to have ethicists on board for a very long time, but that has changed. So recently, uh, major companies that work with uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence have appointed uh, uh, you know, uh, members of the board who are ethicists and philosophers and who are supposed to guide the future, or, um, our future with moral, hopefully, machines. Uh, the same happens at MIT, where I work, and at Harvard, we have uh, AI um, Ethics and Governance Center, just newly established. So we are, again, uh, as, as before with effective computing, we are very early here with that field, but I'm very hopeful that this will be a, a big topic, you know, and that in 2018, uh, well, some of you, or some of us, perhaps, will meet here again, and then we'll have definitely more to discuss, because by then, some initial guidelines should already be uh, definitely established. Great, thank you. We'll take another question if we've got one.
So anyone who has a question, you might head yeah, to one of the microphones. Thank you. Ah, Pradeep, we'll start with you and then we'll flick over to oh, sorry, Peter. Uh, just, a, just a quick question. Uh, we hearing, we're hearing a lot about the technology that isn't something in the future. It's, it's here now uh, and we're talking a lot about the benefits of it. So the question I have is uh, how should these benefits be distributed? Because if we have these technologies which can augment our senses, in the case of Neil, etc., uh, should we just leave it to the marketplace and those who can just afford be augmented, or is there another model? Terrific question, very much in the vein of this kind of where we're heading this conversation and the distributional fairness of all of this. Uh, Sam, do you want to have a word with that one? You deal with these distributional fairness questions in your world? Yeah, I mean... Um I, I have an unpopular view about some of this, which is basically that, uh, sorry Pradeep, but uh, that, that we, we live in an unfair world. And as human beings, we are a very competitive species and we, we don't live and we never have had, a, you know, an egalitarian world, ever. Ever. We won't allow that, you know, and so there will be issues, there will be haves and have-nots, and there will be, uh, there will always be people who are on the fringe, and there will always be people who are on the inside. Is that right? Is that fair? No, it is not uh, uh, by, by, you know, our, our own moral compass, and yet collectively we still choose some of the things that allow that to happen. We vote in certain ways, and we behave in certain ways and when we may not be proud of that part of us and we may not want to admit that we have that part of us but obviously collectively we do and individually we do as well and it's just there it is part of our base human nature and so I, I, I think it will never be quite fair and we will always have some divide not one divide many divides in different ways and people will see and view some of those divides as disadvantages and others will see them as opportunities and um, it's just how it, it always has been I so. guess one of the questions would be is there an equivalent so government puts fluoride in water supply so that we have healthier teeth there's public education that might not be as good as what you can pay for but there's a starting point is there an equivalent is there something and we can't imagine what this is today but two generations from now is there something that we make available to everyone so at least if they want to opt into a tribe they have the choice to do it rather than it be a necessity that they have financial means I don't know it's a great question to ask though um, well, can I just, because mm, becoming a cyborg is not expensive, it, it's not for rich people, you can become... He'll do it for you this afternoon if you want it. Yes, yeah, so for $10, $10 you can extend your senses, it's chips that we are using daily, like the one, hand dryers use chips that you can remove and you can use them as earrings so that you can feel what's behind you. It has nothing to do with, with money, otherwise rich people would be cyborgs and they're not. Uh, cyborgs are poor people like myself and Manel who has a sense for just $30. It's created by himself, so it's, you can extend your senses and, and uh, uh, extend your perception of reality using senses that already exist that are extremely cheap. It's if you want or you don't want to extend your senses. That's the main issue. Socially, uh, it's, it's still not popular and it's, it's done by artists now. But it's not a, 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 a point of money. It's, it's if you are ready or not to modify your own body. And I think we'll see societies that are used to modifying their body, they will be the first ones to actually do it. And so we might see that in Africa, many people will become cyborgs because they are, uh, in their culture, they are used to modifying their body in ways that it's not normal in Europe. So maybe we'll be surprised and Africa will be a place where there'll be many, many cyborgs, or people with new senses. We've got... Two questions, and then we're going to do a quick uh, wrap-up of views. So, Peter. Can I just ask us to uh, explore a slightly different aspect? It seems to me that a lot of the conversation here is about how we are using machines to enhance our abilities or how we are using our abilities to enhance machines. It's machine-centric or technology-centric. Uh, I'd just like to talk uh, or hear from maybe the psychologists and the others about how we can enhance our own technology, that is, our human consciousness. What is happening in the 
field of inquiry about advancing our human consciousness to higher levels and deeper levels and broadly connected levels between us all. Could we talk about human consciousness as the technology to be truly yeah. advanced? Patricia, yeah. I'm going to obviously Thank throw you. to you Love there. Thank you for the yeah. question. Um, well, what's really interesting, what we see in, um, in this space called psych tech, which is the space, you know, humanity multiplied by technology in some way, and I would say it's much more human-centric, is we see that technology is multiplying things. Now, it multiplies it for good and multiplies it for bad. So research done um, you know, on loneliness, for example, which is some claim that this is the next epidemic that's coming, um, just people feeling very, very lonely. Um, children, especially children, children who are naturally feel lonely, um, technology kind of multiplies that feeling. And so we, we see a rise in you know, loneliness, anxiety, suicide, low rates. However, kids who are, are naturally interacting with other, human, with other kids in the, in the natural environment, actually technology multiplies their, you know, their, their, their social butterflies, not only in this, this life, but also in, 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 the, in the virtual life. And so we see that magnification um, element. Um, I would love, you know, one thing that I would love to give to everybody is actually, I think, three things. And, and I do think we can use technology for that. The first one is self-awareness. Um, where am I? Where am I heading? That man search for meaning. Where am I? You know, what's the tool to understand our own technologies, if you wish, right? Um, our mental structure, growth mindsets versus fixed mindsets. I mean, there's so many amazing things we can explore. Um, that are parts of the human technology. The second one is confidence. And I would say confidence is the ability to, um, you know, turn our imagination and visions into action and, and really get our hands dirty because, you know, a lot of those beautiful ideas exist only in heads and unfortunately, you know, those kids are somewhere and they're like, I don't have the tools or I don't have the courage to do things. And, and, and that's what confidence is and I think it's a fantastic thing to download, if you wish. Um, and third technology that I think we, uh, we, um, we all should, and that's actually part of wisdom, is compassion, it's, and especially self-compassion. You know, the amount of abuse that happens inside our heads is astonishing. Um, anybody here has a self-critic in their head? <laughs> um, a lot of us, a lot of us, and, and that holds us back. And so I, those are the three I would give to everybody. You. You know, if technology can multiply that, you know, the awareness, confidence, and compassion, I'm hands down, you know? Okay, thank you, Patricia. We're gonna take one last question and then I'm gonna get a one minute thing from each of the, one minute kind of closing observation from each of the panel as we converge as the kind of the human and, every, and, the, uh, and, and our artificial and robotic kind of forms of life converge. What is the thing that we should be thinking about as that happens? What's the one thing you'd say, think carefully about as we go on that journey? Um, and just a one-minute reflection to wrap it up. Wrap it up, and we'll start at that okay. end. But last question. Uh, uh, listen, uh, very great conversation. As a as a neuroscientist, I've really enjoyed the uh, full spread of, of perspectives. I think the the, the the real question for me that we're kind of skirting around is, well, what does it really mean to be human, and and what is that? So I want to hear your perspectives on what that really is. I'm not talking about technology. What is the human angle? All right, well, we'll take a couple of, uh, just a couple of answers to that. We'll, uh, why don't we take a cyborg perspective on that? <laughs> um, I think being a human is part of a long path that started by being bacteria in the ocean, and now we, are, we call ourselves humans, and we are witnessing the renaissance of this species because we are now merging with technology, and we will slowly become a new species. So we, it's part of a long process, and the aim... I guess it's to become a species that can actually survive in space. So that will be the ultimate aim. We will be a species, the first one probably, that can leave this planet and live in other um, worlds. So that's, I think, part of the process. We are now getting closer to becoming a species that can actually live in space. And we call ourselves human, and we value being human very much, but we should be aware that this is just part of it, and we shouldn't be scared of becoming less human, because we've not always been human and we will not always be human. I think it's good to call ourselves trans-species because we've always been evolving from species to species and we shouldn't be afraid of becoming a, a new one. Okay, so we're given the, we're running against... Uh, Can I? 
short. Oh, no, no, that's fine. It was long, so. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk later. I had that yeah. feeling. Comment. So we're going to do just a short set of, as we all go away from here tonight, having had a conversation where there's a consensus about convergence, a concern that we make that future that's more convergent, that we build a lot of human values into that to try and make this a better kind of set of uh, new types of entities that emerge. What should we most be thinking about as we look to that future? Just a one minute grab. Um, well, not really about thinking, but more about feeling. Uh, really, let's not be afraid would be what I wanted to say. I also saw Terminator, like most of you. It's a film that is constantly destroying my life in many ways. Even though I love it, it just, I just also hate it because it uh, prevents me from working, you know, in, in peace because always somebody says, ah, you're the Terminator person. Uh, so let's not really be afraid because, you know, machine learning, um, coding, artificial intelligence, these are also inclusive things. You said that this is not expensive to become a, a cyber. It's also not expensive to code. I come from Poland. We have the best developers, second, well, number two developers in the world, even though the country is not really rich, you know, because you can learn these skills. And I think artificial intelligence will be a good project if it's an inclusive project, if we all participate in it. If it's not a project that is closed in some sort of, sort of labs that nobody can access, really. So. We can all do it, for, for sure our children can do it. And uh, if they're into it, just let them do it because the more uh, people will join in, the better project it will be, that I'm Great. sure of. Yeah. Thank Sorry. you, Thank you. <laughs> Neil. Yeah, I guess Quick this minutes. process yeah, also needs to be, we need to respect each other. We need to make all the options available to as, as many people as possible so that people can decide what they want to do or how they want to relate with technology. So I guess respect to all the uh, options that people might want to choose is, is one of the, I think, the main things. We have to get ready for the diversity that we will be seeing in the next decades, diversity uh, that we need to respect. And that's, I guess, the biggest issue. How do we get ready for the diversity that is coming in the next decades? And to build on, you know, not being afraid and, and being more inclusive, we really have to um, um, come at this with a lot of self-awareness. We have to really understand who we are uh, in, individually and as a species. Not, not easy at all to do, because from that, that depth of understanding will come a, a more compassion, inclusiveness, fearlessness, and all the rest of it. So. I think that... We are going to understand ourselves more as machines and we're going to see our machines more and more humanely. And this is why that's good. So the things that go on with the human brain where it malfunctions, where we age and die, where we have depression and anxiety and mental illness, that's you know, kind of the last great frontier of prejudice. And as we see that more and more in a mechanistic way and something we can fix almost with a wrench, will be able to fix it, but also will be able to understand and have compassion for people who are going through things that we can't quite understand now. And then the other way, our machines are taking on more humane qualities. Really think about this as the world waking up. All the little inanimate objects, you know, artificial intelligence maybe starts out as a utility that you can plug into or log into, and then finally just spreads everywhere. That, the world becomes this magical place, and what happens if we then deny that false dichotomy of man versus machine, mm -hmm. and we do have these mergers, and we're able to do great things like, like gods, like magical creatures. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Patricia, one minute. Think of that. One minute. Um, um, I would say explore this one um, precious, wild, raw, Messy life. Thank you, Scott. That's hard to follow. I'll say three things. Number one, creative innovation is awesome because it brings together people like this. I learn so much every time I'm part of this discussion. Thank you all for teaching me something. Number two, keep your imagination stoked. Watch movies, read fiction, go and have raw experiences. Make sure that you go and experience the future. It's happening today already. Number three, parents learn from your children. They will remind you the creative, creativity and curiosity that is at your core. And so on that note of creativity, I'm going to invite Tanya back on the stage to close us out with a final song. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen.
Can we give an enormous thank you to this extraordinary panel of wonderfully diverse, raw, human thinkers. Give them a huge round of applause. And we're going to stay on stage and have a photo in a moment. And I want to firstly thank all of you. Many of you have been very generous tonight in supporting our charity Creativity Australia and the With One Voice program. We so appreciate that with all our hearts. And one of the incredible things that happens to us as spiritual beings is how we connect at such a bigger level than just our body or our mind. When we actually really do connect as one, we start to breathe together and we just reach out and feel this collective energy. And people say to me, you know, what drives you? Well, what drives me is these incredible minds, all of you, your feedback, the energy. I don't know that that's something a robot can ever replace, but I want to sing you a song now uh, which I wrote on the top of Machu Picchu which was a song that I imagined being sung, actually, if something would happen to me, that all the people that I cared about would be in a room together or in a space together. And I think it's just so important to live in the present moment, to be present, to be here. Because it's from here that we can create and work out what future we really want. Carpe diem, seize the day. This is my brand new song with composition by Anthony Barnhill and lyrics by me, Flying Free.
understand as a species, not, not, not easy to understand. understand.